Hello, hello, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this webinar. It's uh, one minute past three, so we can start. I see other people are still coming into the room. Welcome to everyone. Uh, my name is Renata Mirulla. I facilitate the community of practice Eval Forward, who is organizing this webinar uh, today. And it is my uh, pleasure to introduce you to cost benefit analysis and evaluation, overview on the options and applications. Um, this event uh, is responding to an interest that was raised a couple of months ago during a discussion among uh, Eval Forward members uh, precisely on this topic and looking for solutions on how to apply cost benefit analysis in evaluation. Uh, so it's a real pleasure to have uh, here two experts that will lead this event today. Um, just a couple of things before I hand over. Um, one thing is that um, the webinar will be recorded and we will share the recording and the presentation with all of you and all registered participants and they will be made available on uh, the Eval4 website. And also a uh, second housekeeping uh, um, tip is also to please use the chat as in most of these webinars in the interest of time uh, to, for your questions and comments and we will do our best uh, to address them at the end of the presentation. I will now hand over to Alena Lapo. It's a real pleasure to have Alena here today leading this uh, session because we were colleagues in the OFA Office of Evaluation a few years ago. Uh, she's an evaluation specialist uh, who has worked with a number of international organizations. Uh, she's also a board member of the uh, European Evaluation Society and among her current assignments, uh, she is working on OECD Value for Money Initiative. Uh, I hand over to you, Alena. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Renata. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for organizing this webinar and uh, to Eval Forward community for raising this important question of uh, evaluation of efficiency. Um, indeed, uh, evaluation of efficiency, it's a little bit controversial subject and um, um, approaches uh, to efficiency within value for money um, depends on uh, many variables, uh, for example, such as uh, the subject of evaluation and the purpose of evaluation conducted on available resources and on, on demands of particular donor. And uh, this controversy also raised uh, many questions um, among uh, uh, you, among members of uh, Eval Forward community. And some of you asked questions uh, to, about how to evaluate efficiency purely from uh, economy perspective uh, as relations of inputs to outputs and uh, purely um, accounting perspective, while others are more interested in um, deeper evaluation of economic and social benefits. And you are interested in tools and methodologies and examples. So all those topics, I believe, Renata, uh, are sufficient for a series of webinars, but this particular will focus uh, on cost-benefit analysis and how CBA can help um, to respond to some of those questions. Um, I know that we prepared um, a short uh, quiz poll, and uh, you can put it uh, on the screen if we are ready. So you, you're supposed to see it in a few minutes, right? So it's a simple question. Which of the following better reflect your experience with CBA, cost-benefit analysis? So you perform CBA on a regular basis. You sometimes perform CBA. You receive reports which include CBA. Um, you have only theoretical knowledge on cost-benefit analysis or no knowledge, or maybe uh, it's a different uh, response in your case, please. All right, so it didn't take much time. And uh, as we can see, um, majority, well, not majority, this 
the largest share, but still not a majority of you, 43%, have theoretical knowledge on CBA. And others have uh, some experience with CBA, such as uh, reading the reports and sometimes uh, performing the CBA. And there is a share of you who have uh, less knowledge on this subject. So that's good. It's uh, help us to um, uh, understand and better orientate uh, the questions uh, and uh, group the questions after the presentation. But here, without further ado, I would like uh, to pass the floor to Sylvia, um, our main speaker. And Sylvia, she is an economist and specialist uh, in design, planning, and evaluation of investment programs and projects. She's an expert uh, in cost-benefit analysis, as you already know, and she provides technical assistance and training service to public authorities and project beneficiaries. Um, among her interests, uh, which are more recent, is social economic impact of research infrastructures. Um, along with her research activity, Celia is also a director of evaluation team in Center for Industrial Studies. And she deals with contracts and project management uh, within the Center for Industrial Studies. So Silvia, it's a pleasure. Please, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Alina, for this introduction. Uh, thanks to you and Relanta for inviting me and to Eval Forward for organizing this session. I'm honored to be here and very happy to speak uh, about this topic. Um, I will start sharing my screen in the let me know if uh, everything well? Are you there? Yes, but we okay. don't. You may want to do full screen, Silvia. Okay. Yes, and in the meantime, while you are putting presentation in the full screen mode, I uh, would like to suggest that our participants uh, put their questions um, in the chat uh, while uh, listening to the presentation. Any clarification question or additional questions. And we will save uh, those questions for the um, uh, Q&A uh, directly after Sylvia's presentation. Okay, can you see it now full screen? Hello, can you hear me and can you see the presentation? Uh, we still see um, the view which is, uh, have the slides uh, on the left side, which are smaller and one big uh, slide. Uh, okay, that is strange because my, um, okay, I, I was seeing a different thing. So let's see if now works. Sorry for interruptions, but I want Silvia, you are muted now. Okay, here I am back again. Hope now it works. Does it work now? Yes. yes. Okay, full screen. Here full we go. <laughs> okay, thank you for patience. <laughs> I'm here. Um, as I was saying, I'm very honored and happy to be here. I have the tough job today to speak about cost-benefit analysis, which is a topic I've been dealing with uh, since the last 20 years in half an hour. So I will try to convey to you all the messages that I think are uh, crucial to someone that is uh, not so familiar with the CBA as I saw in the poll. So ma the majority of you have just a more theoretical kind of knowledge of the topic. Um, this is how I decided to structure the discussion today. So let's start with the efficiency criterion, just to place where cost-benefit analysis helps us as evaluators. Then we'll very briefly introduce the cost-benefit analysis key concepts. I will bring you one example because I think that when you see it at work, something is more clear, and then some very quick final remarks. Um, let's start with a definition uh, just to see um, why efficiency is relevant for cost benefit analysis. So here we have uh, the OSCD that principle of, OS, um, of efficiency um, that it's precisely about how well resources are used. So there are two aspects uh, here of the efficiency criterion. One is the use in economic terms um, uh, and, and, and the way in which inputs are converted into outputs. And then we have the dimension of time. We will focus on the economic dimension. 
We have here another uh, definition uh, from the Better Regulation Toolbooks. This is really uh, um, coming from my experience with the uh, EU institutions. Um, and here again, there is this idea in the efficiency of comparing um, input and output to see whether they are commensurate and whether the costs, the, the input that we put into a project uh, are justified uh, on the basis of, of what we get out of this project or program or initiative. So efficiency looks at whether different choices or the choices that were made um, in the way in which a project is delivered, is implemented, um, are justified in terms of the use of resources. So the key elements, but also the challenges in the efficiency criterions is um, um, to what extent the alternatives that we have in front of us uh, can be uh, feasible and then comparable in terms of quality and results. Now, a problem when you need to do comparison is that you need to compare homogeneous things because otherwise a comparison is simply not possible. So one big problem that we have in um, uh, public projects or projects that deliver public goods is that uh, typically costs are, are much more clear because they are mostly expressed in terms of money then the benefits that we get out of it. Uh, in some cases, we are talking about intangible type of benefits. So for example, um, quality of life, um, fresh air, uh, drinkable water, uh, better health. So these kind of benefits uh, or accessibility are uh, less easily tra uh, translatable into a monetary term. So we have different aspects that are expressed in different ways. So the comparison can be difficult. Now, is cost-benefit analysis a way to solve this problem? Uh, cost-benefit analysis is, is, is grounded in welfare economics. So um, we have here a definition of what is the purpose of a CBA. There are a number of Nobel Prizes that uh, during the history of, of cost-benefit analysis has contributed to develop um, um, the theoretical framework and also the practice. So the idea is that the purpose of CBA is to provide a consistent procedure for evaluating decisions in terms of their consequences. Um, so it's a way uh, to compare and to structure the analysis of the pros and cons of a given funding decision. And then uh, it provides a criterion uh, on the basis of which we can decide whether the decision is good or not. So in principle, it sounds like a possible solution to the problem of uh, how to make comparison for the purpose of judging about efficiency. Um, CBA can be applied in different fields. So you can look at individual projects or you can look at policies, you can look at legislation. So there are a, a vast uh, number of fields in which CBA has been applied in practice. It has a very long history. Uh, it has been, uh, it, it was born in France um, um, and it had been um, uh, born, was born in the context of um, um, the development of public works um, uh, at the, at the Annal de Ponte Chaussée. So it was an engineer, actually, the father of course, benefits analysis, Jules Dupuis, who had this problem, very practical problem. He was uh, building. Um, bridges and roads, uh, and he had precisely this, this problem. Those kind of uh, public infrastructure were not told, so they were non-revenue generating. So he had by one side the cost, which was uh, clearly identifiable for him and measurable, but from the other side he had the benefits uh, to, the, to the citizen, to the population in terms of um, uh, time saving, better connection, accessibility of places, and he didn't know how to translate this kind of benefits into something that could be comparable with the cost. So this long history and traditions and the fact that CBA has been then applied in very different contexts, institutional, but also geographical contexts, you see here some milestones, um, um, made um, uh, to the uh, result of having different traditions, uh, both national but also sectoral traditions that were developed over time. So you may find different, different guidelines, different manuals, different um, analytical framework that uh, are developed in different contexts. Um, 
I am particularly more familiar and have more experience uh, with what has been uh, done uh, by the European Commission since 1999 for the uh, application of cost-benefit analysis to major infrastructure projects, um, but there are many other uh, traditions uh, and, and practices. So there are some variations in the way in which CBA is actually carried out and put in practice in the different institutional field. But in a nutshell, um, CBA is, is about um, a structured way of uh, identifying all direct costs and benefits um, to society. And you have here to bear attention to the first order effect, so direct costs, direct costs and benefits. So we are not looking at secondhand or wider effects. It's pretty much on focusing on, uh, on, on the direct effects of a project, of a particular public intervention along a given time horizon. Another crucial aspect of CBA is the fact that it looks into the future. Why you need to look into the future when you do this kind of analysis? Because typically, especially for large infrastructure programs, you may have costs which are um, quite close to the present or are now, and you have benefits which spread over time, in some cases a, longer, uh, a, a, long, a long time horizon. So if you don't consider the time perspective, you run the risk to have to, to weigh more the costs which are closer to the present than the benefits which are um, far away in the future. So in order to have a balanced approach, you need to consider a long time horizon. Cost and benefit must be incremental in the sense that you have to use a proper counterfactual. A typical way, this should be the case in all the good evaluation project when you do impact evaluation. You have always to compare a situation with the project with what would have happened in the absence of the project. So what we, could, we usually call it a, pro, a counterfactual situation. So in case you are building a brand new project, the uh, counterfactual is no project at all. But if you have an infrastructure already there, if you have a situation which is already running and you are, for example, improving the situation or expanding an existing infrastructure, then the counterfactual situation is more a kind of an inertial scenario where you go ahead with what you have. And in terms of calculation, it can be rather tricky. You have to pay attention to that. Then the point is to assign direct costs and benefits a monetary equivalent, which means to translate everything into a unique numerator, into a unique base value. Because only in this way you can really make a sound comparison of, of um, the, the magnitude that you are considering. Then you have to discount future value and capitalize past value because you have to compress your long analysis in terms of time horizon to a present value because you are taking your decision now. In this way, you can compare the cost and benefits. And then if the net result is positive, the intervention is desirable. So put in this way, it may sound um, easy and quick, which is not really the case when you really um, uh, go into the, the core of the exercise, which is, I would say, point three. And it's precisely uh, to have a monetary equivalent for all the direct effects that you observe. Now, the central, the, the, the core aspect of cost-benefit analysis is all about shadow prices. You may have heard about shadow prices. The, the key point is that um, uh, market prices, or the one that we observe, the prices that we are observing the market, are not a good signal of social value. Because in some cases, market prices simply do not exist. If we think about fresh air, there is not a price for fresh air. Uh, but it's important for the society to have fresh air and to have clean air. Or if we think about accessibility or time saving, there is not a true market. There is not a true price for the time of the people, but it's important for us to save time when we have to go to, to work or also we go on holidays and we don't, have, we don't want to spend more time than what is actually needed to reach our place. So in some cases, cases uh, market prices simply do not exist. In some other cases, they exist, but perhaps they do not really represent the value of what we uh, uh, want to measure. Think about, for example, the ticket that you pay for visiting a museum. 
Um, can you really say that the experience and the joy and, and, the, and the value of that experience is fully reflected in the ticket that you pay for visiting the museum, for accessing the museum? Perhaps not. Do you have the sense that this is not really, if you simply compare the cost of the running the museum and setting up a museum with the revenues that it generates, you are missing something important there. So shadow pricing is precisely about the effort of getting the right prices, uh, right in terms of what? Prices that really reflect the social value of good and services. So um, um, in economic terms, um, um, when market prices do not correctly reflect the scarcities, um, this is because is what we call the market failures. So the asymmetry of information, externalities, public goods. So there are a number of reasons in the literature, in the economic literature, why market prices are not good signals. So um, um, shadow prices are these um, um, non-existent prices, prices that you cannot observe in, in the real world, but are prices which are good enough to reflect the social value of a good of a, or, or an output. In some cases, market prices are okay if the market is not distorted. In some other cases, the market can simply not exist or be distorted. So in those cases, um, instead of using market prices, we need to look for the shadow prices. And how we do that? Um, there are two um, key concepts be behind the idea of shadow prices. One is opportunity cost, and the other why the, the other the other one is willingness to pay. Um, you may have heard uh, of those key concepts. The opportunity cost is defined as the potential gain from the best alternative for a gun when a choice has been made uh, between uh, several se several mutually exclusive alternatives. Now. Uh, let's put your let's take your decision of um, attending this seminar uh, today. Um, you have taken a decision. Uh, possibly you have done your cost benefit analysis very quickly in your brain when you decided that it was worth coming here. Uh, what you are investing, the cost of coming here, is uh, the time that you are investing. The opportunity cost of this time is what you are losing. Uh, what was the best alternative for the use of your time? So if you didn't come here, you possibly were um, at your desk in the office doing some job and, and going ahead with your everyday activities. So the opportunity cost of your time uh, spent here in this seminar is the best alternative for gun that you decided to let it go uh, because you, you, you decided to come here. So... The value of this training, of this, not a training, of this seminar, of this conversation today for you should be at least equal to the cost that you have in invested. So to the cost of leaving there some of the work that you have to do. And, and only in this way, your cost benefit analysis is positive. So you will tell me at the end of this seminar if it, were, if it's, if it was worth having. Opportunity cost is commonly used to value input, so it's mostly a relevant concept for the factor that you use into a project. So um, the value of the cost of the land or the civil works that you put, the labor that you put into uh, the implementation of a, of a, of a project or an initiative. Willingness to pay instead is more from the side of the outputs so the services or the goods that are produced in a project. So when can you say that the price or the value of a good or service uh, fully represent the value that the society puts on it? One way of, of looking at that is uh, by thinking about the maximum amount that people would be willing to pay for a given outcome that they view as desirable. You do not have here to think uh, about um, actually purchasing something, but um, um, the measure of the value that people uh, uh, put under um, a good or service that in, in real life has no market price. So these are two, two concepts. Uh, they are a little bit 
theoretical, I understand, just put it uh, like this. But in, in the practice, there is a lot of experience and there are a lot of um, um, technicalities and methodologies that can be used to value and to finally get a number. Because in the end of the day, it's, it's all about getting a number that you can put into your calculations. So here is more or less the, the idea about prices, shadow prices. You have to value goods and services. You have to see whether market prices is available. And if it's available, whether the, the, um, it reflects the social value. If it does not reflect the social value, then you have to go. There's a, an arrow here missing, I, I think, because if it, if it does not reflect the social value, you have to go for market price cannot be used. And if it's not available or if market price cannot be used, then you have to go for the willingness to pay or for the opportunity cost. And what about um, uh, estimation of those opportunity costs or, or willingness to pay? There are many different um, uh, ways in which you can uh, finally derive um, uh, a number. They have different reliability, Cost requires different um, um, ex um, expertise, um, and you have uh, several possibilities depending on what you are doing, which is the time frame, which is the resources that you have, um, and they go from stated preferences. Stated preferences means that if you don't know how much is the value that the people uh, put on a on a good or a service, you ask them. Stated preferences means um, uh, running surveys uh, in such a way that by having multiple type of questions, you can understand which are the factors that influence the preferences of people uh, for a certain good or service and how much these preferences can be valued. Uh, this can be done with the survey methods, with statistical methodology, which is not really just asking how much is the price, but are uh, rather um, a more complex way of getting uh, the, the measure of the preferences of the people. Another way of doing this is by going for the reveal preferences family of uh, methodologies, which is, I don't ask people their opinions uh, directly, but I observe the behavior of the people uh, in such a way as this can reveal me how much they appreciate or how much they value a certain good or service. So for example, travel cost. If to enjoy a visit to a museum, uh, I not only have to pay a ticket, but I also have to travel to this place, then perhaps the cost that I have uh, um, uh, borne to reach the museum and also perhaps the city, um, it's something that at least partly reflect the value that I put on the visit to this museum. Hedonic prices. Hedonic prices is about um, looking at the increase in the prices of real estates uh, because the surrounding uh, has been improved for, from a, a quality of life point of view. So, for example, um, we know, we observe that um, the houses in a nice neighborhood, for example, with a lot of green, with a lot of nice places well connected to the city center, um, are valued more than um, um, houses in other neighborhoods without such services and, and nice, nice places. And we can do some calculation to see to what extent this increasing price reflect what we want to value. Defensing behavior is another way of doing this. So uh, the family of revealed preferences is all about looking at the, uh, be, the actual behavior of the people to understand to what extent these reveal their preferences for, for something that we want to value. Finally, benefit transfer is simply looking at what has been done um, um, in other contexts, in other studies, uh, for other types of research, and using the value that has been applied in similar projects uh, with some adaptations to our, to our accounts. So it, it, it's something like borrowing um, the values that have been used in similar contexts on projects um, in order not to redo uh, the full assessment. 
very briefly, this is how it's done, but there are libraries full of um, methodological work that explain how to do in a proper way these kind of calculations. So very, um, very quickly, I want to um, um, tell you how we carried out a cost benefit analysis. It was um, almost 10 years ago, I have to say on behalf of the World Bank, it was a CBA of a small uh, road that was running um, in the north of Ghana. Uh, it was connecting two cities, Navrongo and Tumo, in the two um, uh, regions of the Upper East and the Upper West in Ghana. Uh, it was actually um, uh, a CBA which was done uh, after, uh, during the project construction, actually. So the World Bank, uh, the, the, the decision, the financing decision was already taken action. The World Bank wanted to better understand whether it was really worth having this, this road and whether it was worth um, um, finishing the investment. So we're talking about the reconstruction of a 25 kilometer section of this road, which was also upgraded. The situation was, was this one. So you see that um, um, the road was very in a very poor condition. And during the rain season, um, you had this, this in some of the places, you had stones, you had big holes. And during the rain season, it, it get melted and it get very difficult for the people um, to, to use the road. So what they had to do, you see here, the diverted um, the diverted um, uh, route that they had to, 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 from A to reach B, they had to do the long road because in some cases it couldn't be possible to, to go along, along the road. So uh, who was using uh, this road? There were people living in the villages around the road were predominantly smallholders. Um, uh, we are talking about uh, the, one of the poorest and less populated regions in, in Ghana. Um, most of uh, the economic activity was uh, uh, agriculture. Um, and um, the farmers were using the road to reach the market centers where, where they have to sell the products. But also, uh, not only the vehicles were using this road, um, there were also uh, a relevant share of non-vehicle traffic that was made by people using the road to access the primary public infrastructure and services, such as the schools, the healthcare centers and markets. Um, so um, improving uh, the condition of this road was a way to help the local population um, either to go and sell to the market the agricultural product, but also to improve the accessibility to the primary um, social infrastructure. We relied on the traffic data that were provided by, uh, we are talking about, let's be back to um, here, we are talking about a, 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 a project that was costing uh, something like 30 million uh, Ghanaian sedi. It was the, the, the old currency. We're talking about something of less than um, a half million euros. So it was a very small infrastructure. Um, it's here, yes, exactly, it's 30, 30 million. And um, so we relied a lot on the feasibility studies and on the traffic data that were provided by the Ghanaian Highway uh, Authority. And you have here the numbers of um, um, all the traffic, uh, not only the situation, AADT stands for um, average um, uh, annual average daily traffic. So you see, uh, the, the counting, the, those statistics were provided by the um, highway authority, not only the situation before and during the project construction, but also the projection into the future. We use here a time horizon of 25 years. And you have here the disaggregation of all the different types of traffic. Um, so we have both the vehicle and non-vehicle demand. So we had also the numbers of the pedestrian, the cycles and the motor bikes, which constituted a, a large amount of um, a relevant share of the traffic of this uh, road. So the cost and benefits beyond the cost, the actual cost of um, borne by the um, um, highway uh, authority, there were some social benefits, but also social costs that were not represented in financial terms for which no market values were 
available actually, we wanted to include in our analysis. So from the side of the benefit, we identified two which are the typical benefits of, of transport project. Vehicle operating costs, so the costs that are borne by the owners of the road vehicles to operate them, which include the fuel consumption, lubrificants, so everything that it's related to the, the maintenance and the actual costs to operate the cars or the vehicles. And the time saving, because time saving is experience when you have a good road, when you do not have to divert uh, with, um, um, from, from the um, uh, shortest route. Um, so there is a lot of time saving there. You have also social cost because when you improve a road, you, have a, you generate traffic. So you have an increase in the emissions. And you have also additional accidents because all road projects imply a risk for the users of suffering an accident, which includes both direct and indirect costs. Direct costs are, I mean, the, the, the cost of rehabilitation and the cost that you need to suffer. Indirect costs are also the fact that you uh, lose um, uh, economic product because you don't go to work, of course, in the time that you recover from, from the accident. So how to include these additional aspects that are relevant for this project? Here you have, I just showed the result of um, the calculation of benefits. So travel time savings, um, it was calculated in both the two scenarios with and without the project, the savings uh, in terms of minutes for the different categories of uh, vehicles, uh, but also for pedestrians and motorbikes and cycles. Um, and also, and then you see how much this was um, uh, then worth. So you have uh, that um, the, the breakdown of benefits by the categories of traffic. So in this way, you can also understand which is benefiting the most, which are the categories of users that are benefiting the most by this project. The same applies to the vehicle um, operating cost savings, uh, which we estimated using the data that were available uh, from the authorities and previous studies. And you have here uh, the calculation um, the, yeah, with the number that we got. And here we have the final results. So you have in the table of the top, the breakdown of benefits uh, between time savings and vehicle operating cost savings. And you see that there are almost half and half. And it's interesting here to see that if you look at the time saving, um, there is a super relevant share of benefits, which is coming from non-vehicle traffic. Now, it was very important to really understand the context in which this road was, was constructed and rehabilitated, because indeed it is not common to have data related to non-vehicle traffic when you rehabilitate a road of, of that, of that um, uh, of that nature. The point was that we did a field visit so we could observe ourselves the fact that uh, a huge number of people that were using the road was actually people that were walking uh, at the side of the road instead of going into the savanna and, and, and it was dangerous of course to, to walk in the savanna instead of walking close to the, to the road. So we decided to include also these observations into this um, analysis. Um, I don't show here, here the results of, of the social costs, but in the results, uh, you have also, um, you see the costs in terms of investment, but also what we wanted to include in addition in terms of accidents increase and increase in the emissions, um, uh, in the air emission. And here you have the final, final results where we show that in the baseline case, uh, the project is positive. ENPV stands for economic net present value, which is the sum discounted of all the cost and benefits. So we got a positive result. And ERR stands for economic rate of return, so 10% um, rate of return, which is good. We also performed a sensitivity analysis because, of course, when you project into the future, there are a number of, of uncertainties beyond uh, and, and, and some um, assumptions that you need to do to um, develop the analysis. So we check with some sensitivity analysis these results, and we also got that in the worst case, there was also the possibility to have a negative uh, result of this project. But this kind of analysis also helps you in some way forces you to think about which are the key assumptions, which are the key conditions that can make your project work, and which are the, the risks, the, the possible source of risk that you have to try and control and mitigate if possible. 
So this is very quickly an example, just very few final remarks about how to, um, a few words about the CBA. So I think you get the sense that the CBA is a data intensive activity that needs time, competencies and resources. Uh, you, you need to be familiar with the, with the technicalities. You need to, to know the methodology. It gives you a good framework to understand what is the cost, what is the benefit. In some cases, it is not so straightforward. You may run the risk to do some double counting or to overestimate or underestimate some effects if you do not have a, a clear structure in mind and a clear analytical framework. Um, but you need time and experience and competencies to run this kind of analysis. And also the CBA needs to be embedded in an appropriate institutional and regulatory framework. Why? Because of course there are um, incentives uh, uh, for manipulations of this number. If you don't have a system that requires the CBA to be carried out in the appropriate timing in order to inform the decision, if there is not a system that checks for the quality of the CBA, if there is not a system that provides the analyst with the true tools, um, with benchmark values, for example, with the key reference parameters uh, to be used consistently for in a given sector, in a given country, then of course you open the door to possible manipulation or misrepresentation. And in the end of the day, what I used to repeat in all the training in all, all, all the time that I speak about CBA, uh, this exercise should not make you thinking that, that it, it's all about getting the right number in the end. But it's really the intellectual exercise and the process of building your analysis. Because when you have to build your analysis, when you have to understand which is the right value to put into each and every cell, and the way in which you, you, you want to value the effects that your project is, is bringing to you. You learn a lot about your project. You learn a lot about the possible causes um, of, of deviations from what you have planned. So it's, it's a very good exercise, planning exercise, that should be fully owned by the owner of the project. Um, while sometimes it's, it's an analysis that, has, that, that is carried out in some cases also after the, the, the financing decision has been taken by some external consultant just for the purpose of having all the right papers in place. And this is a missed opportunity as I see it because it's a very pow powerful tool if it's really owned and if the exercise, the intellectual exercise um, behind is really understood and, and owned by the project promoter. This is all, and uh, thank you for your question, if you have. All right, thank you very much, Sylvia. Uh, actually, we do have questions, and um, I would like to start with the one um, maybe directly related to uh, what you said in your last slide, that that's a process of searching for the right um, for the right uh, cost, for the right analysis, and not the value itself. Because we have a question about whether there are uh, some uh, ready models uh, which help to uh, conduct um, cost-benefit analysis and estimate uh, economic rate of return and uh, estimate some of uh, intangible uh, benefits, um, such as life quality and uh, quality of education. I understand that here, um, an interest in education project. Okay, there, there, there are a lot of, um, as I said, there is, uh, there are a lot of traditions, a lot of uh, manuals, uh, guidelines, uh, and um, um, reference books that can be used. In terms of models, um, we've been asked uh, several times to uh, develop um, uh, tools or softwares that can ease uh, the work of the analyst in performing the analysis uh, when doing a cost-benefit analysis or to use some, for example, um, already prepare um, Excel sheets or web-based tools that can automate some of the routine calculations. I know that some agents, some national agencies have developed for internal, um, for their internal use, some 
software or templates for the analysis. This is this this is um, this can be done when you when you have homogeneous projects which are um, more or less um, similar. Um, what we used to say is that every project is different from the other. And also the data on which you build your, your uh, analysis um, are different and, and uh, the assumptions behind can be different. So it's very difficult to standardize the type of work that has to be done, the type of analysis that can be done. You can have templates about how the final table should look like because the calculations are always the same. But it's very difficult to, to tell the analyst how you get there because it really depends on what is available. Um, there are some standards, but as I said, there are more internal tools of some authorities. So I'm not aware about, about public um, uh, models that you can access. Um, there are some, uh, for example, uh, Unido is, is, is having a, it has a software for industrial projects that is called Comfar. I don't know whether it can be accessed for external. So I don't know whether it's for public use. Um, and I came across uh, some of other um, institutions that have their internal tools. But I will not say there is a unique reference. All right, but probably if we can uh, think about uh, post-factum and share with our participants at least some references that would be uh, useful. Um, for the sake uh, of saving time, if um, you don't mind, Sylvia, I will shift to a different question. Um, we have a question from um, Samuel, uh, which is asking uh, about um, how the 25 kilometer road in the example of Ghana would look like if we would speak about uh, cost efficiency or cost uh, effectiveness. So here maybe it's worthwhile to actually uh, say the difference, uh, explain the difference between uh, CBA cost efficiency and cost effectiveness, and then uh, it helped to address uh, the question uh, of Samuel, um, how it would look like if we put a different criteria. Yeah, cost effectiveness uh, is, is, is a cost benefit analysis, it's a cost benefit analysis without the final step, basically. Cost effectiveness is about the cost per unit of outcome. In this way, an indicator of cost effectiveness is the cost per kilometer of the road. So basically you take the investment cost and you divide it by 25, simply in a rather, in a rather simple way. If you want to take as an indicator, the traffic that is used, you can take the investment cost and you divide by the number of users. So this is another way. And then you can compare um, similar project on the basis of this kind of indicators. So unit cost, for example, or the cost per passenger, or the cost per vehicle, for example. The limitation of cost effectiveness by one type, it, it, it may look um, um, quicker and easier because you don't have the step of then putting a value, putting a monetary value on the outcome, on the effect. Uh, but you uh, do not reflect the multidimensionality uh, because, for example, as I showed in this analysis, we, con we consider different type of effects, different type of benefits and different types of um, costs. Uh, and we could add all together into our analysis and we could see the balance. So how much uh, is uh, the, the time saving effect? How much is the vehicle operating cost effect? Cost effectiveness is more, um, um, uh, it's not a multidimensional type of indicator. It gives you the cost per unit of outcome. And you can compare on the basis of a unit dimension, basically. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I hope that uh, addressed somehow Samuel's uh, question. Um, I see that Malika um, actually put a few questions uh, and you touched uh, this subject already in the presentation. Um, she's asking how to quantify uh, qualitative inputs um, related to um, uh, quality of life and education, uh, the time saving, if there is a unique formula. Um, so I know you touched it in the presentation, but um, maybe you can- No, no, there is not a unique formula. 
Um, or unfortunately or luckily, because uh, we are valuing complex aspects, so we would be surprised to have a unique formula to evaluate everything. So as I said, there are different sectoral traditions. If we look at education, for example, one common way of um, valuing the human capital formation is the expected increase in income because of the additional um, educational program uh, that people receive. Um, or if we look at quality of life, depending on how quality of life is, is trained, for example, if you're talking about uh, the increase in, I don't know, amenities in a given place because you have cleaned the water of a river which was polluted, then you can think about uh, the leisure activities that are performed in that area because of the improved um, quality of environment. Um, uh, and a typical way of doing this is to estimate the willingness to pay of people uh, of living there or going there. Um, in the case of um, um, uh, public parks, for example, I had an experience with the urban park in the center of um, a big city, big metropolitan city in Italy. Um, we use the travel cost that I was referring to in one of my slides. So the, the, the public um, uh, park was open for visitors. So we estimated the number of visitors that were visiting during the week, but also during the weekend. And then we estimated the travel cost that they were um, um, supposed to, to bear to reach the, the public place. And also the, the time that I decided to spend there. If you decide to go to a, a public park, you decide not to use your time to do something else, to go to the cinema, to do other, other activities. So depending on the type of um, effect, um, it's very important, however, to really spell out what we're talking about. Quality of life may mean many different things. So it's very important that we really identify the direct effect and what we are talking about. Yes, thank you, Silvia. Um, I think that maybe we could post factum identify some sources for more common uh, benefits uh, which exist, uh, but usually that's a very high level and uh, not that easy to apply to smaller projects or unique uh, interventions. Uh, now I will move to a different uh, question, um, also um, relate to the um, um, evaluations um, and benefits. We have a question from uh, Dick Tinsley, uh, who is asking how often actually it happens that the benefits um, are artificially inflated to fit um, and uh, to prove the project uh, feasible, especially probably uh, in institutions um, which sponsor big um, projects like uh, European Commission and uh, other donors. And he is referencing um, that the cost uh, of um, roads um, of, uh, of emissions tons kilometer tripled from paid roads in Zambia. So um, I assume that uh, maybe he relates to not correct estimates uh, which registered, uh, maybe he can explain it. But the first question, how often um, are the benefits uh, reflected not correctly to fit uh, and prove the project feasible? Well, there is a vast literature documenting the fact that um, it is uh, quite common to have a misrepresentation uh, or, or um, mistakes, but also mistakes in some cases can reveal. So in some cases, as we said, we are looking into the future. Uh, we, we don't know, of course, nobody has the crystal ball and we have to do some, uh, we work with assumptions, we have to do some forecasts. So it, it, it is quite common to see that ex post, um, what we observe deviates from what we have forecasted ex ante. So in some cases, it's just errors, it's just simply that we didn't know, it's a matter of uncertainty. In many cases, it was documented that it was simply that people did not put enough uh, capacities in the forecasting uh, exercise in the analysis did not put enough resources, uh, but also um, strategically misrepresented the reality because it had the incentive to have the project um, um, approved. So how we can avoid or limit this practice? Well, 
we need an institutional setting where CBA is taken seriously, where there are measures uh, to uh, check the quality of the CBA, uh, where there are um, uh, ways to uh, check whether a given number uh, is in line with the standards, with the benchmarks, uh, uh, and um, if uh, the results of the CBA are actually used um, um, to take the final decision and can make some difference in in the game uh, between the promoter and the funders. So you need you need a framework in place um, because otherwise it can be, of course, relatively easy for an analyst to play with the numbers. Thank you, Silvia. I see that we have um, very few minutes left. Renata, do I have uh, time for one more question? Yes, I'd say yes. I think there's one left, I see. Uh, there is more than one, oh, more than one try, to, try to group them. Um, in uh, your presentation, uh, speaking about CBA, Silvia, you mentioned uh, that CBA is mainly focused on direct effects and that secondary effects are not taken into account the long uh, term effects. So uh, there is a question uh, why it's so, because uh, many uh, projects in health, in um, uh, even in transport have many secondary effects which are spilled out and important. So why not? And from another point of view, I see that Marco Antonelli is actually um, uh, challenged with estimation of this uh, second and third effects and interested if uh, there is a way how to get a better assumption. Coming back to the conversation um, of how difficult uh, to um, have correct assumptions and uh, how much probably research uh, and forward looking studies we need to look, probably be specialist in the sector. Yes, no, uh, there, are, there are two reasons why we focus on direct effect. First of all, because uh, the, the theoretical foundations of um, the CBA in welfare economics tells us that if shadow prices are estimated in, in an appropriate way, they should also already reflect the adjustment in secondary markets. Um, but there is another more practical um, uh, reason why we should not go too far away um, secondary effect may uh, be linked um, uh, by definition, not only to the project, but also to other conditions that uh, materialize beyond the project and ext are external to the project. So there, there, there is a problem of attribution of secondary effect or side effect to the project. Uh, so if you are adding to all direct effects, also all the secondary effects, you can, the risk of uh, double counting or overestimating the effect of that specific project are very, very high. And linked to the second question, so how to do the appropriate um, uh, forecast, um, a good way is, I mean, again, the literature and the experience tells us that um, what is called the optimism bias is always there. So there is a tendency, a psychological tendency to um, uh, over uh, overestimate the benefits and underestimate the cost for a matter of enthusiasm, but also of incentive to promote the project. So in order to counterbalance the uh, optimism bias, it is always good to have a prudent approach, um, a, con a conservative approach on forecasts. So always stay low on the benefit and a little bit higher on the cost. Typically the forecasts are made uh, on, on ranges of values, and it would be also always good to be on a more prudent on the prudential side because if the project is okay in the prudential case then you have a higher probability that the project will go even better thank you Sylvia. actually it was one of my takeaway from uh, the larger training i took uh, with industrial studies and uh, you as a trainer with your colleagues that um Indeed, it's better to be conservative. Uh, and in evaluation, we know that uh, once we start uh, speaking about attribution, especially when there are projects with many partners, it's always presents so many challenges and um, the CBA here is more conservative. So I believe that we um, really probably even few minutes late and I pass uh, the floor to Renata for the final words. 
Thanks so much, uh, Lena. Thanks so much, Silvia. This was really an intense and very interesting uh, webinar. I got passionate about CBA <laughs> myself. So thanks. I saw a lot of uh, participation and questions. And thanks to all the participants. I'd like to ask Angelo to just uh, share a final poll to let us know. We hope you enjoyed this and it was a good use of, of your time, as mentioned by Silvia. Uh, but let us know your interest and let us know uh, if you have other ideas also for future webinars, uh, please feel free to uh, use the chat and to, yes, uh, this is a closed poll, so you can say how much, if you, if you find this webinar interesting and how much, and, but you can add your comments on the chat. Um, thanks to all, and uh, we will follow up with the recording and the presentation with all registered participants, as mentioned, and on Eval Forward, you, you will uh, hear more about future um, events. So for those who are not registered yet to ever afford, please uh, go there and uh, register. And thank you all, Alena and Silvia. It was great to work with you and thanks to all participants. Yes, and thank you for thank this you. feedback. <laughs> thank you, thanks a lot. It was a pleasure. Um, I would suggest that if there is something very specific that uh, maybe we can follow up with, uh, with they can drop uh, a line to Renata and um, we will try to do our best uh, to provide uh, some useful tips. Yes, for sure. And also the list of resources and links. I saw uh, someone also shared the software and also the one that uh, Silvia shared. We, we will gather some useful resources. But yeah. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.